Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, so continuing with our constitutive analysis discussion, uh, the present lecture we will be covering the relatively higher strain rates okay, uh, where we do actually hot working okay, and uh, actually we have missed uh, the, the part where we can cover super placidity but, we, but I am not doing that right now. So, we have covered very low strain rate where creep is uh, important. Okay, and then next one in high temperature deformation, the strain rate which comes between 10 to the power minus 5 to let us say 10 to the power minus 1 or minus 2, okay, there you can see super plasticity, super plasticity in material. And then we can come to the hot working processes like uh, the conventional one like rolling, uh, forging and extrusion. Okay, from 10 to the power minus 1 to at least 10 to the power 2 okay. and uh, uh, even higher strain rate more than 10 to the power 2. Okay. So, we will see two models here right now which is still uh, going to come under phenomenological model okay, uh, which covers a relatively higher strain rate more than 10 to the power 2 and uh, the strain rate where you do the hot working. Okay, so, that analysis will be more. Okay. So, slightly the sequence is uh, little bit different. We have done very slow strain rate. Now, we are doing relatively very high strain rate 10 to the power 2 and more and then we will be work, uh, discussing about the hot working which is the main focus of our discussion. So, again phenomenological based constitutive equations okay, and uh, so, the constitutive equation for high strain rate deformation, okay. so as I was telling you that in this case my strain rate will be more than 10 to the power 2 uh, strain rate. Okay. Uh, one of the most uh, important or uh, used model is what we call as Johnson Cook model. Okay. This model uh, uh, takes care of uh, all the three parameters basically because uh, here are again you can see that we are working on very high strain rates. Okay. So, there is not enough time for dislocation to recover. Okay. So, strain hardening is an important uh, uh, consequence of that, that a strain hardening will be there in this type of deformation, very high strain rate deformation. Okay. And this Johnson Cook model is the one of the most used model in that segment. Okay. And I am only discussing uh, couple of models in each of this category. Okay. Actually, if you go to any review paper or something like that book, okay, then you will see there are large number of models uh, with sl slight variation okay. or sometimes the, the more famous models are modified for particular material or particular condition. So, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay. You have very large number of models in each of these categories. Okay. I am just covering maybe one or two just to give you a flavor of uh, the whole uh, idea of constitutive equation development. Okay. So, if you see here the, the, the stress is dependent on the all the three parameters. So, you have a strain and a strain hardening exponent, then you have a strain rate. Okay, and then you have a effect of temperature. The strain rate is in the form of a strain rate some star which is basically you are normalizing it with the with some reference strain rate. Okay. Similarly, temperature is being normalized here okay, and it is used as T star. Okay. So, uh, the, uh, the other parameters are A and B are A is the yield stress at reference temperature and reference strain rate. Okay, and B is the coefficient of strain hardening. So, of course, because it is coming here, so it has to be 
coefficient of a strain hardening n is a strain rate hardening exponent ok sorry strain hardening exponent c m are the material constant which represent the coefficient of a strain rate ok uh, uh, strain rate hardening and thermal softening uh, respectively ok. So, one of the important uh, uh, idea which you should understand here is that when we do any high temp high strain rate deformation ok whether in hot working or in this case even higher strain rate is uh, more than 10 to the power 2 ok. There is always a temperature rise in the material actually you uh, understand that we are when we are working on the material when we are deforming the material we are inputting uh, energy into the material ok. So, some energy where which you are inputting goes in the deformation process ok that means plastic deformation and some energy goes in the in form of heat ok. So, there will be heat generation whenever you do a deformation that you can also experience when you are for example, you take a metallic wire and you do uh, a, a repeated deformation like this and you will if you touch the material after some time it will be uh, sufficiently hot means you can easily feel it ok. So, the heating will always takes place when you are working on the material some uh, energy will go in of course, in the deformation process but most of the energy goes in heating the material. When you are doing at a slower strain rate ok this heat has uh, you are giving enough time for this heat to dissipate ok. So, there would not be any temperature rise in the material as such, but if you are doing a deformation at very high strain rate then you are not giving enough time for this heat to dissipate, dissipate and that is what we call as uh, uh, from uh, your thermodynamics you must be knowing that is what we call as adiabatic heating. That means, when you are not allowing or adiabatic temperature rise because you are not allowing heat to dissipate. So, you have created a adiabatic condition. So, at very high strain rate when you are deforming the temperature also because you are not allowing heat to dissipate temperature will rise above the temperature of deformation. So, for example, you have set the temperature of deformation as 900 degree Celsius and you are doing a very high strain rate deformation what will happen the temperature will lie rise to 950 degree Celsius I am just taking an example. Now, this 50 degree rise you should understand that temperature will always come in the exponential term ok. So, stress is dependent exponentially with uh, at, at temperature. So, a linear rise in temperature which will give a exponential rise in the or in this case exponential drop in the stress ok. So, what you are measuring the stress is you, you are thinking and because we, when you develop the constitutive equation you will take temperature as 900 degree Celsius because you are thinking that you have done at that your furnace was set for that, but actually the material is deforming at 950 degree Celsius because of adiabatic heating. So, you have to compensate for this temperature. So, this temperature so you basically what you have to do is you have to change the stress level ok to compensate for this temperature rise ok and th that is, is uh, as I was telling you that there is exponential dependence between temperature and stress. So, basically you if you plot log sigma versus 1 by t ok then you will be able to know that what is the, uh, the dependence of stress on the temperature. So, any rise in the temperature will be you will be able to compensate by changing the stress ok. So, basically the you have to bring down the temperature from 9 whatever you have measured is for 950. So, you have to bring down that stress for 900 that means, uh, if my in a stress strain curve if this is my stress which I have measured after the compensation the stress will be obviously higher than that because the temperature will be uh, will be low should have been lower than that ok. So, this type of uh, temperature compensation in stress you have to give when you are doing at very high strain uh, when you are doing a high strain rate deformation ok. Uh, so, just uh, uh, I forgot to bring it out earlier. So, I am doing that it now. So, basically Johnson Cook model if you see 
okay it contains three terms so the first term brings out the effect of strain on flow stress okay you have a strain term with a strain hardening coefficient the second term brings out the effect of strain rate okay and the third term bring out the effect of temperature on the flow stress okay so all the three uh, parameters the important parameters are uh, considered in the in the uh, in the flow stress term uh, however in this in this johnson cook model uh, the parameters are considered to have a independent effect that means independently change in strain rate is not going to affect the uh, or not going to influence the temperature and strain similarly independently changing temperature is not going to affect the strain and strain rate and so on and there won't be any effect of uh, so uh, on the stress there will be only the effect of change of stress uh, temperature okay and there is no going not going to be any effect of strain and strain rate okay which is usually may not be the case because there are always interdependence and there is a, a in interdependence of all these parameter and they sometime uh, kind of have a combined effect on the stress okay so but johnson cook model was a very simple model and that is why it is very popular also because you can easily use this model to make a constitutive equation so for a rough kind of work you can easily use it very quickly however some modifications were uh, proposed by other researchers on this model to take care of this uh, coupling effect okay uh, one of the model i am just discussing it here uh, which was proposed by these two gentlemen okay uh, ural and caro okay this is the reference for that they have modified uh, this johnson cook model okay they have suggested uh, some modification so they have coupled uh, temperature with strain hardening okay uh, so that they have proposed that it should be the temperature and the strain hardening should be coupled because uh, when you increase the temperature there is always going to be effect on the strain hardening exponent okay so it, these are not independent enhancement in strain rate sensitivity in the dynamic regime with a smooth and continuous transition between two distinct deformation regime okay so uh, strain rate sensitivity is also going to uh, be affected by in the dynamic regime okay and there will be a temperature dependent strain rate sensitivity also so uh, you you should understand that these are all uh, parameters are all coupled to each other okay so we cannot treat them independently and there are lot of modifications were proposed by different researchers on johnson cook model but uh, uh, for a quick development this is a very good model if you are working in a high strain rate regime that is more than 10 to the power 2 to, to use a johnson cook model for any uh, to understand or to model any deformation process which is working at that particular uh, strain rate okay so this is for high strain rate deformation now we are cover going to discuss the constitutive equation for hot working okay so now again my strain rate range is let's say from 10 to the power minus 1 to 10 to the power 2 strain rate okay so in this uh, regime we are uh, looking at the uh, the constitutive equation and again you can uh, uh, relate it with what we were discussing during phenomenological uh, uh, constitutive equation that this phenomenological constitutive equations are developed for different temperature and strain rate regime so you can also now see very clearly that for different strain rate uh, windows we are developing different type of constitutive equations one window we have developed for creep kind of deformation okay one we have already developed now for very high strain rate more than 10 to the power 2 okay and the, the the look of the equations is quite different okay so for each regime you have to develop different set of equations and in that regime also there are multiple models so you should not consider that there is only one model 
there are multiple models to uh, uh, to relate the stress with the, the these three parameters okay so in this uh, in this particular uh, regime uh, we are going to discuss this arrhenius type equation okay uh, which relates the stress uh, as a function of temperature with exponential term okay so basically again we are de developing uh, developing relationship between the stress strain rate and temperature and this particular equation was uh, proposed by these two scientists sellers and taggart basically what it is doing okay so you have z again zener holloman parameter okay which uh, bring out these two uh, uh, parameter together uh, strain rate and temperature okay uh, of course our uh, temperature will always come under exponential term okay and they relate this z with the stress okay we are taking here p i am using it for saying peak stress okay so when you are deforming the material okay if you remember if you have a single peak this is my peak stress sigma p okay so you can use uh, so sometime you can use steady state stress okay or peak stress okay so here we are using peak stress to find out the constitutive equation okay so this is this uh, stress is actually related with zener holloman parameter here by this sin hyperbolic equation okay so th this is a very general equation a uh, sin hyperbolic equation to relate the stress with the uh, zener holloman parameter okay and of course there are couple of constants here alpha a and stress exponent n okay uh, different uh, uh, constants are there so a alpha n are experimentally determined constant and also q is also going to be determined experimentally only and it is activation energy okay alpha is uh, because you can see it is multiplied with the stress it is called a stress multiplier okay and what it does is it it brings alpha sigma in correct range so that we get linear and parallel relationship between ln epsilon dot and ln hyper hyperbolic alpha sigma p okay so basically this is we use uh, this multiplication okay with alpha we use to bring the uh, whatever plots we are going to get okay they should be all linear first and they they should be all parallel to each other that means they should have similar uh, deformation behavior okay so they, for that it is kind of a adjust adjustment parameter you can say which is we are multiplying with sigma t okay to bring these two curves uh, linear and parallel we will see these curves so then you will be able to understand that what uh, we mean by that okay now this arrhenius type of equation this general equation so i would call this hyperbolic equation as a general equation for a very large strain rate range okay that is my general equation for a very large window of strain rate of course uh, when you are talking about strain rate it is uh, ultimately stress is also going to be related to that so at low stress this same equation can be reduced to a power law equation okay already we have seen this type of equation okay a power law equation where epsilon dot and sigma p is related with a some exponent n prime here okay and again temperature is in exponential term okay so this is a uh, one type of uh, relationship where the epsilon dot and sigma p are related with some exponent here and whenever you have this kind of uh, equation okay let's say i would say a equal to b and raised to power something okay let's say q here then these are called power law equation okay there is a power uh, over b so that is why it is called power law equation so <coughs> uh, so at low stresses you will have this power law equation okay 
and uh, incidentally this type of equation is also valid for uh, super plasticity ok. So, there also you have a power law equation as you go to higher strain rate ok and basically higher stresses. So, there is a mistake here I would write is a higher stresses. So, where alpha sigma is more than 1.2 then this generalized equation can be reduced to a exponential equation ok which is given by uh, equation like this ok. There is no exponent here now, but there is a um, multiplication of a new very uh, new constant which is called beta ok. So, beta sigma p is there, but the sigma p instead of power now has come in the exponential term whereas, here it was not in exponential term, but there was a power over it ok. So, these are some subtle changes in the way we are writing constitutive equation for different strain rate regime ok. So, sin hyperbolic is a generalized equation and these are uh, equation for a specific domain. So, for low strain rate low stress condition you will have power law equation, but there is a power law breakdown as you increase the strain rate ok. So, at higher stresses you have this exponential dependence of uh, strain rate on the uh, on your stress ok. So, this the multiplication here beta is actually again there is the same alpha the stress multiplier is there and the n prime exponent which is in the power law equation. So, you have to multiply these two to get beta ok. So, the, these are the different uh, variation of the constitutive equation in different strain rate regime ok. So, now we will use this uh, all these particular equations ok to calculate uh, our uh, all the parameter of our uh, constitutive equation ok. So, you can see in this particular constitutive equation you have q which you want to know, there is a n which you want to know ok, there is alpha which you want to know ok. So, these parameters are required for development of the constitutive equation ok. So, calculation so first we will start with the calculation of n prime ok which is shown here ok. So, calculation of n prime ok equation is this which is basically our power law equation for lower strain rate and lower stress condition ok. So, this is my power law equation. So, epsilon dot is related with sigma p to the power n prime exponential minus q by r t ok. Again uh, we will do the same thing ok. If I take log on both sides then ln epsilon dot ln of a 1 plus n prime will come down now ln of sigma p and exponential will go minus q by r t. So, now if I plot a curve between ln epsilon dot ok and ln sigma p ok. So, that is what we have plotted here in this figure ok you have plotted ln epsilon dot and ln sigma p ok. Then the slope of this. So, if I differentiate this equation ok. So, of course, the constant terms will go become 0 and then n prime will become. So, at constant temperature so this will also become 0 at constant temperature and this is obviously a constant. So, these two terms will become 0 ok and uh, so n prime will be equal to del uh, ln epsilon dot upon del ln sigma p ok. So, basically it is the slope of this curve ok. So, these three equations or these three curves are at for these three different temperatures ok. So, basically how we have got this uh, these uh, data. So, 815 degree Celsius you have deformed the material at different strain rates 3 4 strain rates for example ok. From there you have got this 4 or 5 uh, data points. Then again 850 degree Celsius uh, we have deformed for 5 strain rate. So, 1 2 3 4 5 again 5 data points and so on. So, for each strain rate what was the stress that is measured you take logarithmic uh, logarithmic of strain rate and logarithmic of uh, ln of sigma p and that will give you these three straight lines or more or less these are parallel ok. That means, there is no change in the deformation behavior at these three temperature. 
So, I can take the slope of these particular curves as n prime. So, this is how I am going to get the n prime for my constitutive equation. Okay. Now, the next parameter I want to know is beta. Okay. So, beta is what we saw in the, uh, the other one the exponential equation which was valid for higher strain rate or higher stress condition alpha sigma more than 1.2. Okay. So, you have this beta term here okay. and beta as I told you earlier also beta is equal to alpha n prime. So, n prime already we have calculated. Okay, now, we want to know beta here. So, again for from this equation beta will be uh, I, I can again uh, take ln of this equation. So, it will be ln of epsilon dot equal to ln of a 2 plus this exponential term. So, it will be simply b sigma p and this is also exponential term. So, it will be minus q by r t. Okay. So, again uh, taking at constant temperatures. Okay, so, we will take the constant temperature here. So, again this term will be 0, this will be 0. Okay, so, beta will be simply if I differentiate uh, beta okay, uh, or if I take a, if I differentiate this then this will become 0 and this will become 0. Okay, so, this will be 0, this will be 0 okay, and this beta will be del ln epsilon dot upon del p, del sigma p. In n prime it was del ln of sigma p. So, now it is del sigma p. So, what we have plotted now sigma p on the x axis ln epsilon dot on y axis. Okay. Again you can see you have got some straight lines, okay. straight line fit is there again at different three different temperature for different strain rates okay. and from the slope of this you will be able to get beta. Okay. Now, we will uh, calculate and uh, we will do the calculation of n. Okay. So, uh, already you can see that I have got the alpha parameter here because I know beta I know n prime. Okay. So, alpha will be simply equal to beta upon n prime. So, alpha means uh, alpha is automatically uh, calculated once I know the beta and n prime these two uh, parameters. So, now I want to know what, what, what is the calculation for n. Okay. So, already we have seen this equation the sin hyperbolic equation. So, z which is this. Okay. So, this is equal to actually z epsilon dot exponential q by r t equal to a sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p to the power n. Okay. So, here it is n in, in the power law equation it was n prime. So, that is the difference. Again, we will take the ln on both the side. So, ln epsilon dot okay, equal to ln of a plus n will come down ln of sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p and if you would have taken ln here, it would have been plus q by r t, but you have taken it on the other side of the this equal to sin. So, it is it has become minus q by r t now. Okay, so, ln epsilon dot equal to ln of a plus n ln sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p minus q by r t. Okay. So, now again you can differentiate this equation. So, again I can differentiate this equation. If I do a differentiation, okay, I, this will again become 0 and if I am doing for constant temperature this will also be 0 and this will also be 0. So, n will be equal to ln epsilon dot uh, del ln epsilon dot divided by del ln sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p. Okay. So, now uh, what I am going to plot is ln sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p on the x axis and ln epsilon dot on the y axis. Okay. And now you can see that uh, we are again uh, doing it at constant temperature for different strain rates okay. and these are now linear curves obviously and also parallel that is what was the purpose of using alpha okay, to make these uh, graphs as parallel and uh, linear. 
okay. So, from the slope of these curves now, okay, you will be able to find out what is the uh, stress exponent n, okay. So, this is how actually you will do calculations, okay. That, that is why I am doing the whole calculation in fr front of you, so that once you have data, you can do all this calculation yourself. All these things can be easily done on any spreadsheet, whether you want to use Excel, Origin, okay, or any other software, okay, it does not matter. You can use it very nicely, uh, you just have to take logarithmic and uh, taking sin hyperbolic, multiplying by something and so on, okay. So, uh, and once you have the plot, uh, you can find out the slope very easily by fitting a trend line and finding the equation of that straight line, okay. So, slope will give you the value of n, okay. So, all these things you can do very easily using any, uh, any software. Okay. Now, we want to know that what is the, uh, what is the activation energy. Okay. So, calculation of activation energy. Uh, for calculation of activation energy, uh, our temperature will change okay. and uh, uh, strain rate uh, will remain same. Okay. And also please uh, note down, uh, I forgot to mention it earlier that these are all apparent activation energy. One activation energy you also get from the diffusion data, okay. those, those are true activation energy. These are apparent activation energy. Uh, the reason is because the microstructure is, is continuously changing during the deformation okay. and these are not uh, activation energy calculated from one specific uh, mechanism. Okay. We are trying to predict a mechanism using the activation energy. Okay, so, the, the microstructure is not going to be uh, a stable microstructure or for example, uh, you, you are deforming at different temperatures here. Okay. So, now maybe uh, if you are deforming at different temperatures, uh, earlier also if you remember we were seeing in dynamic recrystallization okay, that as you change the temperature, the, the, the flow curve changes from a single peak. Uh, where it shows uh, discontinuous dynamic recrystallization to multiple oscillating peak uh, kind of stress strain curve. Okay. Uh, also, uh, uh, if you remember we were seeing some flow stress curve, where at low temperature it is showing strain hardening, then at some intermediate te temperature it shows dynamic recovery, then even at higher temperature it shows dynamic recrystallization. So, steady state sometimes softening and so on. So, th the idea is that the microstructure is continuously changing, it is dynamic. Okay. So, when we are calculating the activation energy from the data of different temperatures, okay, the, the activation energy which you are getting is going to be a apparent activation energy. Okay. If you want to calculate more accurate activation energy, what you should do is when you are deforming at a strain rate, let us say you are deforming at 0.1 strain rate. Okay. So, what you do during the deformation itself, you change the temperature okay. and because then the microstructure has not changed, it would not have been different so much in during a very short duration. So, basically you are deforming let us say at one temperature, you change the temperature deform it, bring it to again the same temperature, maybe go below and so on. Okay. So, by doing that, you are actually trying to have the same microstructure and in the same microstructure, you are changing the temperature and for suppose this is T1, this is T2, this is T3, you are, you will get corresponding stresses. Okay. So, then you will be able to say with more confidence that this is my activation energy of deformation. Okay. Uh, the way we are calculating is uh, we are not doing it like this. Actually, what we are doing is we are doing test at different temperature. Okay. So, this is T1, T2, T3. Okay. So, uh, T1 is more then T2 is then T3. Okay. 
and suppose we have done this all the at a constant strain rate. Okay. So, this is what we are doing now. Uh, so, again taking the, uh, the previous equation where we uh, took the logarithmic, okay. so this particular equation, okay. again we are using it here. So, ln epsilon dot is equal to ln a plus n ln sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p minus q by r t. Okay. And again you are doing some rearrangement here. So, this we have kept here and uh, I am taking this on this side and ln a on this side. Okay. So, it will become q uh, uh, by n, n r t uh, and we are also dividing by n after taking it there. Okay. So, this will become positive when I take it here okay. and uh, ln epsilon dot is already positive okay. and this ln a will become negative. Okay. Uh, and also I am dividing by n. Okay. So, now you do not see any n here, okay. but you have divided by n. So, q by n r t plus 1 by n ln epsilon dot minus 1 by n ln a. So, the slight rearrangement of the earlier equation. Okay. And dividing by by n on both sides. Okay. So, you will get this equation, okay. nothing difficult here and again we will do a differentiation. Okay. Now, this is at a constant strain rate. So, you are this is going to be 0 okay, at a constant strain rate, this is already a constant. So, del ln sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p upon del 1 by t. So, 1 by t is my another variable will be equal to q upon n r. Okay. So, for this what we will do? We will do a plot between 1 by t which is shown here as t in t to the power minus 1 and ln sin hyperbolic alpha sigma p. Okay. So, if I do that, I, I will get again these curves. Okay. More or less all the curves are linear and uh, parallel to each other. So, I would say that there is not much change in the deformation mechanism at different, tem different temperatures. Okay. So, uh, now from the slope, okay, from the slope of this curve, uh, this slope is equal to q n r equal to the slope is not it of this. So, to get the activation energy I will multiply n r with the slope. Okay. So, this slope is equal to q by n r. So, if I multiply the slope with n into r, n already we have calculated earlier, r is your universal gas constant then I would be able to get the activation energy for deformation. Okay. Usually activation energy for deformation uh, which you get through this kind of processes comes very high okay, compared to any uh, known diffusion processes or solute diffusion processes okay, uh, because the dislocation movement also requires certain amount of activation energy. So, all those things get uh, combined. Okay. And it is sometimes very difficult to assign any physical meaning to this kind of activation energy calculation. Okay. Sometimes it is difficult. So, with this uh, we have uh, uh, completed the different calculations which we are going to do uh, for development of the constitutive equation. Okay. So, the example we have taken for constitutive equation is the Arrhenius type of constitutive equation. Okay, so, whatever parameters are going to be required in that, that we have seen that how we are going to do the calculation. Okay. So, once you know that uh, this is how you have to do calculation, you can do it for some other models also which you think is suitable for your material okay. and that will be able to give you a constitutive equation which you can use for doing maybe if you are doing any modeling work, okay, FEM modeling or any other modeling for your uh, deformation process. Okay. With that, I uh, thank you.